it's genius because basically Neil said, okay, I'm going to create this prequel series, prequel, <laughs> that's really a sequel and it's a loop, it's a giant loop. And what, not only was that ambitious, but what ends up, what, how it changes what you read in the regular series. It does. The motivations of Morpheus completely alter. Uh, there's one incredibly prominent writer we haven't talked about that you've worked with, Neil Gaiman. Uh -huh. uh, what's working with him like? Uh, joy and sweetness, I guess, is the best, best words I could describe. Um, his work always has this poeticness to it. Yeah. And when, when you speak to him and have conversations with him, even if he's speaking about something ordinary, uh, you can feel that poeticness in, in the way he just uh, presents himself. He always speaks with such ease on the phone. Um, uh, one of the, my favorite moments working on Salmon Overture is uh, he was working, I can't remember which script it was, which issue it was, uh, but we're talking, he wanted to talk about it a little bit um, and he had, it was so funny and sweet because he ends up reading it to me on the phone. He hadn't sent it to me yet. And so he, I, I had the luxury of Neil Gaiman reading to me <laughs> on the phone. It's like a you soothing know? voice, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, um, and that was a very creatively open a working situation too and fascinating in the way like oh so like before he got started writing he asked me to create a list of things i I'd, I'd like to draw and i didn't really know so i just started randomly writing whatever came down to my head like oh insects would be cool i love westerns uh you know just made this list and i sent it to him and he somehow found a way to get most of it in there you know but he loved it i sent it to him he's like he's like this is perfect this is great you know um and was very um very collaborative and, and and came to me for a reason i felt like he he wanted what i brought to the table uh in terms of how to pre present the visual narrative that he wanted um so that was extremely gratifying. It was a very uh, rewarding experience. Did you know that there was a rumor around 2004 that he would be doing a Prometheus story with you? Oh, really? I don't know if I've heard and that. There was a rumor in the fan circles. I have no idea if there was any truth to it whatsoever. But ever, ah. since, ever since we fans read that, we were like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and that if it would... wasn't Promethea, then Sandman was obviously the next, the, right. the best option because, um, you know, the Immateria and then you got the realms of night and time. Like, how do you yeah. come up with that stuff? Like, how do you design that stuff? Oh, I don't know. Especially um... since the other things that you do are so grounded in reality, like Gotham City. Uh -huh. Um. I don't know. Okay, so like with night and time, the idea was to present these cosmic forces um, that exist outside of known reality uh, that are the parents of the endless. And the endless are already kind of outside of normal reality and these mythical godlike beings. And so I was like, well, if the endless are as peculiar as they are, how do, what do I do to, to, to make the parents even more so? To make them in some ways almost unrelatable because they're so strange and their realities are so strange. And then I, you know, we got to draw uh, 
you know, when I got, got time to draw that stuff, one of the things I wanted to do to correlate the two, even though Knight's stuff is so murky colors and you know, these strange flor floral black shapes and nothing is, nothing is traditional panels. It's all, you know, you literally, you are in another reality. The, the whole goal was to make the reader feel like they were someplace entirely alien. Um, but I wanted to, to feel like it could envelop you in a way. So all the floral shapes and the, the round shapes having this sort of inviting darkness to them was important. And then when you know, it came time to, to figure out what to do for Father Time, I felt like, well, these two were together at one point. They had to have something that connected them. How could I do that in a visual way to where they could relate? And so I decided to go with Father Time's, his reality being very fluid and unconventional as well. And um, having that same sense of movement that Knight's reality has, but loaded with color in this bright openness, um, which kind of speaks to the differences in their personalities in a way, because Knight seems, the impression I got from Knight is that she's, there's a lot of uh, unspoken things about her and there's this depth to her and Father Time seems very direct. Yeah. You know, very, very direct, you know, uh, and that kind of, so the openness and the brightness kind of felt like it's there, you know. You cannot help but pay attention to him, you know. And um, that the ending to uh, Sandman Overture was just. There's only been a few books in my life where I instantly went, "Wait, what?" and then reread the entire thing all over again. Yeah. Uh, the 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 twist at the end with a uh, when that when that one character isn't who that one character says that character is. Right. I was like, whoa, wait. That's, uh, <laughs> Sandman yeah. is an incredibly rereadable series, but I've never reread it immediately after. <laughs> <laughs> What's fascinating to me, uh, not only that interesting reveal, but in the fact that when Neil was talking about it at the beginning, before he started actually uh, writing scripts, you know, he wanted it to be a science fiction series which I thought was extremely uh, intriguing to me as being a fan of Sandman, uh, taking it into a territory that people might not expect, um, which also helped in a lot of ways to make the series, you know, because my personal goal was to, how do I make it a series visually that honors everything that came before and feels like a Sandman series and, and that feels right, but yet it's showing you something you hadn't seen before visually. So the fact that he wanted to go into a science fiction territory helped that a lot. But then when we started talking about uh, everything going on in the time piece and yeah. Daniel's role and, and that it's a, the, the, it's genius because basically Neil said, okay, I'm going to create this prequel series, prequel, <laughs> that's really a sequel and it's a loop. It's a giant loop. And what, not only was that ambitious, but what ends up, what, how it changes what you read in the regular series. It does. The motivations of Morpheus completely alter um, because the, what's revealed in Overture is he, in order to save the universe in the past, he had to have Daniel send him the timepiece from the future when Daniel didn't exist yet. So that, so the events in Overture, you know, I always thought it was very peculiar when you read the original Sandman and Morpheus is going through these motions of helping bring about Daniel's existence. He's just basically to, letting it happen. Right. right, only to let him, to, only to die, for Dan, so Daniel could uh, uh, usurp the throne of of Dream. Um, I always thought it was so peculiar because I'm like, what? Why? 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 
why is he so okay with this? You know, and what Overture does, it reveals that he, he might not be okay with it, but it's inevitable. It had to happen so he could save the universe. It, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like this foreknowledge of that he won't be the dream king anymore, that this other entity, Daniel, will now be the new dream king and that he will pass away. Uh, it's so powerful in how it changes your reading of the original content and understanding his motivations in a completely different way. It's so, yeah. you know, it's, it's very, it's very cool. I don't know if anything, any other series have done something like that, you know? I love how it was sold to us, the readers, that it was going to answer questions about Sandman that were unanswered. And by the mm -hmm. time it's done, it's like, well, I just have more questions now. <laughs> yeah. Since when yeah. do they have parents? <laughs> 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 yeah and, and the, it isn't, it's just presented to you so matter of factly too it's just like you know <laughs> and i don't know why i'm surprised because i'm like i've read enough neil gaiman to know that he was going to do this <laughs> but, yeah yeah what, I, i'm very curious if he'll if he'll i mean at the time he wrote it he you know a lot of times he talked about it as if it would be the last sandman story by him but then as he got farther along in the promotional process for Sam and Overture he says that all the time <laughs> yeah then he started then right and then he's now he's like well maybe not you know and I started thinking about the evolution of the of the series um and so the series as it is with Overture is this time loop but, but, but that doesn't mean the loop can't go like this and then continue, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Past everything we've seen. So it wouldn't surprise me at some point, because he has a, a line, it might even be an overture. He has a, a, throw, a throwaway line that is quite telling. Where I think he says something, along, I'm paraphrasing, something along the line that even the endless will die. And then, so I have a feeling there's a story that he's got in his pocket that will tell the end of the endless. But what does that mean? You know, yeah, there's, endless. <laughs> so. there's so much still. I mean, uh, you know, DC's basically made it a franchise. There's that whole, the dreaming um, uh, yeah. spinoff series. Would you ever um, like, like, would you ever have interest in, in writing your own for, for, for yourself to draw or. Oh, I, I don't know. Probably. It's not something I thought about. That'd be, yeah, I don't know. It'd be very, I'd be, that'd be scary prospect. I was very nervous when it came time to working on Salmon Overture, which was an odd feeling how uh, trepidatious I felt. I don't know why. So I think if I was to write, write it, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd probably have a mental breakdown. <laughs> I mean, would you would you ever write for yourself a Sandman and Promethea crossover? Asks the fanboy. Oh my gosh, that would be insane, huh? Yeah, I I don't know how long it would take me to figure it out, but it would be the challenge alone would be intriguing to see what would happen. Really, really quickly, uh, what was it like to work with James Robinson? Because I think so. This is fascinating to me. I think it is lost to history how critically acclaimed a writer James Robinson was in the nineties. I, yeah. I think he doesn't get talked about anymore or as much. Yeah. And so, what was it like working with with James? James is a great, great person to work with. He's a personal friend of mine, actually. Really. Um, uh, his uh, main residence is here in, in Las Vegas um before all the pandemic stuff was taking place we and, and before he got busy working with uh on the wb yeah stuff um we would meet all the time have coffee and, and just chat uh working with him a little bit was great the tangent green lantern thing that was one of the things where i learned something was working with him wasn't the wasn't the starman stuff the starman story was great but getting to do the Tangent Green Lantern was a learning process for me 
because I, at first I didn't understand what was going on. When I got the script, this was before I actually had any conversations with, with James, or any you know, of in-depth conversations. And I got the script and I read the, and I saw it was an anthology, you know, of the three little short stories with the little connective tissue of the tangent Green Lantern to acting kind of like a, a storyteller presenter type character. And I was like, I, I remember asking the editor, I'm like, I don't understand. Am I supposed to draw? I'm, I'm supposed to draw all of this, this whole thing. They're like, yeah, we hired you to draw the whole thing. I'm like, but it's an anthology. And the most anthologies are different. different creative teams for each story usually. And so I'm like, okay, this is, this is interesting. But it, it was inspiring in a way because I'm like, okay, I've got three distinct stories and these connective bits so I got four different things I can toy with and, and uh, play with. And uh, it, was, it was cool. So it was kind of, you know, a, a early dabbling of ex style exploration, you know? Um, so getting to work on that informed later decisions, you know? And James was happy with what I did. He, I, when he wrote it, I don't know if he, had written it with the intention of being one artist because they're so distinctly different stories in there you know and uh i remember he talks about that every once in a while how that he was happy with the choices i made of tackling each one differently um but uh yeah james is somebody who we've you know often talked about doing something together uh at some point you know, like a, a big project that we could call our own. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen though. You know, his career is going in different ways than he might even have considered at one point. And- um, Yeah, he's mostly he Hollywood get, now, isn't he? Yeah, and you're right. He doesn't get uh, uh, talked about enough, but I don't know if that's because he doesn't, he's been out of the comics work for a while now that people, I don't know. It's like if you're not most of most of the people in comics, if you're not on the shelf every month, yeah, you're easily forgotten. There's there's very few few creators that manage to retain some semblance of recognition, even if they're not on the shelf for a while. I think this, you know, it's not a very common thing in this industry. But everything he it's I wish he would do more regular comics. If he's incredible. Right, right, yeah. He's great. Yeah, right. He's yeah. Um, he he's very much about creating characters you can relate to and believe in as people. You know, there's that aspect to him. Um, and environments and worlds and yeah, yeah and, and communities. He about history. I think. <laughs> the his knowledge is astounding so yeah, okay yeah. like grant morrison grant morrison we all know has this insane knowledge of comic book history right uh so does james i mean the knowledge he has is astounding well because we will end up talking about comics a lot and he, you know he'll talk about stuff i have no idea you know he just is incredibly knowledgeable and he loves this medium um so I wish he would was in a position to do more, uh, do more with it. But you know the the screenwriting stuff and the behind the scenes stuff he's doing with the WB, you know, he that stuff excites him too. So you know, that's because for me, like I, as much as I love Darwin Cook's New Frontier, I would put up uh, James and Paul Smith's uh, Golden Age right yes. up against it. Uh, yep issue for issue i think yeah. it's just as good yep I um agree. scott dunbeer always tells the story well it always gives out the sentiment that the most the greatest artists are the ones that are most unsure of themselves and mm -hmm. it kind of astounded me on twitter uh when you confess to having imposter syndrome wow. because if you just look at your resume of collaborators james robinson alan moore neil gaiman grant morrison greg rucka 
no one else has this ever in the <laughs> in the history of comics i've checked i've i've double checked i've triple checked i said who's worked with alan moore and grant morrison oh uh gene, gene ha has worked with alan moore and grant morrison but he hasn't worked with neil gaiman uh bill sinkevich has worked with alan moore and neil gaiman but he hasn't worked with grant morrison and so on and so forth no one else has this like I, I, at this point it's just like how do you, how do you of all people have imposter syndrome <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I just, I don't, it, it's kind of hard to explain. I, I acknowledge where I've been in my career, but at the same time, I always feel like I can't rely on that. Oh, I always you. feel like I have more to do. Um, uh i always feel like hope hopefully the my best is yet to come uh whether i'll actually ever feel like i've achieved a pinnacle i don't know all i can say is you know hopefully each new project they take on brings something different out uh but the luck i've had right i mean the luck i've had has been you know pretty insane, especially when you think about, you know, I'm not one of these guys that where you see my work on the shelf every month, you know, where I have, you know, 12 issues a year. I mean, that doesn't happen. And that's a so to have to my work skill, be so though. limited, but still be attached to this, to these very talented, highly respected authors is like, I don't know, it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a testament to your skill though because that means that they are banking on on your work to sell in the, in the book market yeah and collected maybe. editions i've yeah. seen that i've seen that argument a lot where um um would you rather have somebody who can make a monthly schedule uh or or somebody with with a much higher level of art but the the schedule isn't isn't there and I will always fall on this side just because uh -huh. years later when I'm rereading everything, I just rather have the quality. Yeah, uh, I understand what you mean. I, and when I set out to do these things, even the, my own stuff, you know, like what Hayden, Hayden Blackman and I did on Batwoman. I don't know. I'm always, I'm all, I always set out to do comics that I want to read. Mm -hmm. you know to to try to create something that i if it was if it was done by somebody else would i read it <laughs> you know uh kind of thing going on um and there's this whole idea of like trying to create something it's this is bizarre because this is just it's just fucking comic books right <laughs> but at the same time you want to feel like I always feel like I want to do something. Will it matter later? You know, will, will it matter to somebody later? And that's why I hope I always am trying to get with my, my projects, whether it's with these super famous authors or not. Um, will somebody care? And uh, someone today on Twitter, or was it yesterday? I had talked about being almost done with issue six of Echoland. Yeah, and that the the new pages have been kicking my ass because uh, they're so difficult. And they said to me something along the line of, "You know, I imagine the detail that you put in to your your pages takes takes a lot of time, but the evergreen is will be worth it or something to that effect." And you know. I guess it's something that I'm always hoping all my projects would, would be is they're an evergreen pro prospect to them. So like, you know, if you can't do the monthly, God, God, you better hope that you're, you're doing something that will continue to sell because there's not going to be that much content available, you know? So hopefully the content you've, you've made will matter enough to somebody that it'll, it'll have a life, you know? And it does. Oh, it's right thanks. there. See, it's, it's surrounded <laughs> by. <laughs> What's writing 
what is what is drawing uh, with these authors like versus writing for yourself or working with or writing with Hayden Blackman? Um, Hayden and I, we've known each other for a long, long time. The project we're working on together was being developed well before we took on Batwoman. Um, Echo Lens. Matter of fact, huh? Echo Lens, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, it's something that he and I have been tinkering with for a long, long time. As a matter of fact, when, uh, when we, it was getting close to me maybe not continuing as an artist on Batwoman, uh, just, it's just staying on as co-writer with him. Uh, the idea was to start Echo Lands at that point. Um, but then Sam and Overture got presented to us and everyone, even the publisher of Echo Lands, you know, was like, well, you gotta go do that other thing. <laughs> you know, uh, you know and Hayden's like, no, we go do the other thing, you know. When you have uh, a chance to do Sandman with Neil Gaiman. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, working with Hayden is uh, really great because we have we have a synchronicity, and he brings a lot of different things to the table than my, than I do. Our sensibilities, our sensibilities are compatible enough that we make a good team for a, a, a um, competent quality team, I should say, uh, not just good. Um, but we're different enough that we kind of can do bring different things or different thought processes into the process. Um, and the way we write the scripts is kind of unusual. We never stick to the same formula on who's gonna do what. Uh, sometimes he'll take the lead on a script or I'll take the lead on a script or I'll write specific scenes and then he'll write specific scenes and then we'll trade off and pick away at them until we come to a, a unified whole. Uh, and then because we're both getting to be a writer and I'm not working with a different author, I get to have the fun of having a say in dialogue and things like that. So we end up going over the dialogue usually over the phone, we'll hammer out what we think is pretty much a finished dialogue and then maybe make some suggestions after that, either from him or myself. Uh, but once that part is done, I treat the script as if I would anyone else's script, even though I wrote it. Um, I will write my own scripts with the same level of attention as if I'm writing for somebody else, which I've had the opportunity to do, where I put in a lot of detail and ideas I think should be in the script, uh, sometimes have visual suggestions or layout suggestions. Uh, that will work its way into a script even if I'm writing for myself. But once I've once that process is done and I get the script and I'm actually working on the page, I treat it the same way as I would anything else from another writer. That like once I start working on like, oh, I see this idea that I had here in the script where I was going with it. It's not quite working the same once I'm actually working on it and I'll alter it. I just, I'll make changes like I do with anybody else, you know? Uh, uh, so yeah, I'm pretty brutal in that regard about, you know, kind of disregarding that I'm the one that wrote it or yeah. well, co-wrote it with Hayden, you know? Uh, and I'll, you know, I'll treat it the same as if I was working with Alan Grant or Neil, where I'm like, oh, well, this is, let's make it work this way, or, you know. <laughs> what can you tell us about Echo Lens? Like, what would the elevator pitch be? When would it, when would it be out? 